is going to be a little different than, uh, than Glenn's in that I, I want to tell you a story about what happened in our watershed. And I've given this talk a number of times and I, I call it What Happened to Swan Lake. This is uh, our ranch, is Rock Hills Ranch. It's located uh, about 250 miles northwest of here, northeast of here. Our mission is to reflect Christ in how we love people, manage the land, and care for its inhabitants, both domestic and wild. And if you don't have a mission for your place, uh, I tell you that's the first thing you need to go home and think about, is what, what is your mission? What, what exactly are you trying to accomplish with what you're doing? So like I said, our ranch is located, here we are. We're east of the Missouri River, north of our state capital, near the North Dakota border. We get about 18 inches of rainfall and uh, about 20% of our acres could be cropped. Uh, not all of those are, uh, but about 20% could be. Uh, we have anywhere from, I'm just going to say from 7,000 to 10,000 acres under our management depending on the year. Uh, Here's the little town of Lowry. Here's our ranch headquarters, and here's our son, Luke's. He is one of the herd scholars that's uh, with, I don't know, are you here in the room, Luke? He must have decided not to come. He can listen to his dad at home. Here's a picture of our family. Uh, I'm uh, the fourth generation. Uh, my son is the fifth generation, and uh, grandchildren are sixth. Uh, by the way, Garnet and I do have seven uh, genetically enhanced, above average grandchildren. <laughs> we have a spring calving herd and, a, and uh, we don't have a fall calving herd, but we run cows that calve starting towards the end of April and we're just finishing up now. And then we also run yearlings. The yearlings probably make up from 25 to 30 percent of uh, our AUMs. Uh, some of the yearlings are custom grazed and and some of them are our own that we, uh, that we keep for breeding purposes. Uh, we are in our sixth year of uh, having interns. Uh, the intern is on the left. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Fudge is on the right. We keep Mr. Fudge and his mother Petunia around probably for conversation and entertainment value. So we do have a goal, and it's to convert solar energy into products for human consumption profitably by making a positive impact on our ecosystem. And so what brought me to uh, my subject today that I wanted to share with you is this particular lake. It's a lake that I grew up uh, boating, fishing, skiing in as a, as a kid. It's about 2,700 acres, and I grew up north of here about two miles, which is east of our current ranch about six miles. So the, the lake that I grew up with has changed and that's what I want to talk about. So the watershed we're in, it's an easy number for me to remember, is 369. It's about 369,000 acres. I call it the Swan Creek watershed. And in particular, what got me uh, curious about what's occurring in our watershed, this is Swan Lake, it runs over and comes through about 80 acres of our hayland. And in my lifetime, I've seen the plant community within the hayland change. And not only that, but the surface of the hayland was changing. As a kid growing up, this is what it would have looked like. I was fortunate to get this FSA map from my uncle, and this is the area we're talking about. And people would mow it with a sickle mower, and these dots that you see here our haystacks. So every farmer or rancher, there's one, two, three, four, they would cut, come down in the Swan Creek bottom and cut hay. If they're fortunate, they had 80 acres. Most of us only had 40. And so this is what it would have looked like for me as a child growing up. And what happened, and of course this is the type of haying equipment that we personally used in the earlier years, uh, I shouldn't say earlier years, that's probably 15 years ago. But in a normal year, this is what we would expect to produce out of there in terms of tons per acre. Then starting probably in the, in the 90s, we started seeing these type of events happening. And uh, where we were getting inundated with water. Uh, were we used to having our watershed send water down Swan Creek? Yes, but not at the volume that we were starting to see. 
And this is what the result was, uh, either poor hay or no hay. And we know what was happening, but I couldn't figure out, you know, why? Why was this occurring? Why was our plant community changing? And uh, this quest probably started over 10 years ago with me trying to figure out what's going on in, in our watershed and in particular what's happening to our hay ground. So one of the first things that I had the fortunate, was fortunate to see was the rainfall simulator. If you, I, I hope you had a chance to see it while you're here. If you didn't, you should go online and see it. And if you got access to a rainfall simulator, we're fortunate in South Dakota, I think we have, do we have three or four simulators, Dan? Do you know? Yes. yes, okay. So, and there's also a tabletop model. So the, that's the first thing I saw. And you can see the date in here is 2011 when this picture is taken, but I probably saw it in 2010 or, uh, but anyway, a number of years ago is when I first saw it. And then another thing that was given to me uh, by a friend was this uh, program printout that NRCS has got that uh, it's called EFH-2, which was traditionally used to estimate runoff and peak discharge. And they, they used it, he told me, a lot of times to figure out if your watershed was large enough to build a dam and how much water could you expect from various rainfall events. So the way you read this, I've circled it. We took one of my watersheds, applied good grazing. The drainage area was 1,380 acres. So we could figure every other year to have a rainfall event of 2.1 inches in a 10 and a 24 hour, 24 hour uh, time period. The discharge would which could create your erosion was uh, 0.25 uh, cubic feet per second. Or, cube, yeah, rainfall, excuse me, the runoff in inches is 0.25. The discharge is 79 cubic feet per second. So that's what the good grazing for management. Now, if we were to convert that and to minimum tillage, same watershed, same slope, same rainfall event, the runoff becomes. 0.67 inches and the discharge is 30, 377 cubic feet per second. So you can see that how, how land use change can impact it. So all at once the lights started coming on and I started understanding what was happening in our watershed. So and it, you know the story here is that you end up with two and a half, almost three times as much runoff uh, with a peak flow about five times as much. So what are some of the other things that we did on our ranch to try and document how land use has altered um, not just our plant community, but water in particular? As NRCS did a study on our ranch in the, uh, four years ago, and what we did is we had some land that was broke uh, probably 100 years ago on this side of the fence, and on this side of the fence we have native range. So the cropland really had a 30-year history of no-till. And in 2015, we, had, we were seeding it back to uh, a native stand, which you can see in the background. This is the native range. And what we found is our infiltration, the, the study they did, is what they do uh, is they take an infiltration ring and they apply one inch of water and then they wait a few minutes and then they apply the second and they measure the time it takes for the second inch to infiltrate in that ring. So on the, on the ground that had a history of cropping, it took 119 minutes for that second inch to infiltrate. On the native grass, same soil, 100 feet away across the fence, 12, point, 12 minutes, 23 seconds. So we went, we went from 119 minutes to just a little over 12 minutes. Also, they did soil samples to, to document, you know, what's the difference in the soils? What, what, what has happened? So our A horizon is five and a half inches, 3.1% organic matter. This is on the ground that had a cropping history. Across the fence, 8.3 inches and 4.7% organic matter. Now, you heard other people use 20,000 gallons. I was, I've been told, and my research says 27,000 gallons. An increase of 27,000 gallons in terms of water holding capacity 
across the fence just due to land use practices. So, you know, not only don't you have as much runoff, but you, it makes your land much more drought tolerant, much more resilient when you can hold 43,000 more gallons of water. And with that, you know, we start talking where we're at, we start talking about problems with nitrate and potable water. And, you know, when you, when you start having water that leaches through your soil profile because you don't have the organic matter to hold it, or run off because you, you don't have the ability to infiltrate, you naturally are going to have more problems with your potable water. And so the bottom line is that land use has an impact on how uh, water is impacted. So on our rangelands, what we've learned is that they can positively impact water infiltration, they can positively impact water quality, and will result in healthier soils. So, in our watershed, from 2006 to 2012, we had just about 7% of it that was converted. Just about, uh, just about uh, well, it was 21,600 acres that was converted during that time period. So, our conclusions was the hay ground that we traditionally put up was a giant filter strip. And what was happening is the, the water that was coming through that, through Swan Creek, was carrying sediment with it. And when you get vegetation this tall, there's two things that happen. One is it, it tends to slow water down. And two, the sediment that's with it tends to filter out and drop out. So we're starting to see the surface of the ground change and the plant community change. So what did happen to Swan Lake? It's land use in the last 125 years that's impacted it. I don't think I'll see a time in my life where this lake becomes so silted in that, it's, that you can't see water, that all you see is, is water tolerant plants. But I would predict that unless something changes in land use in our watershed, that that lake will turn into nothing but cattails. Uh, right now, it probably is, I'm just going to say at the deepest points, six to eight feet deep. And, uh, but around the edges, there are a lot of cattails that are appearing in areas that historically uh, we were able to graze. Uh, our hay ground as a, as a kid growing up was dominated by western wheatgrass with a little bit of prairie cordgrass. And today, it's nothing but water tolerant plants that are, that are growing on our hay ground. This is a picture of eastern South Dakota. Uh, again, it's based on some research that was done at South Dakota State University. And the red areas that you see in there are where the conversions were greatest. This is the whole state. This is five state region. Again, we're out here. And uh, what you're going to see in this, in this region is there's been a westward movement of the corn belt, corn and soybean belt. But look here. This again from 2006 to 2012 the conversion of land that's taken place. In particular, I'm going to show you a picture of this area right up here. Our ranch is right down here. And fortunately, we're in an area that there wasn't a lot of conversions that took place. This is what some of the results were. And uh, uh, I don't think the Germans from Russia that homesteaded there anticipated they'd have running water at their place 125 years ago when they settled there. But there was a tremendous amount of water and a lot of these types of events that were taking place. And it just didn't come one year and was gone the next year. It's taken about 10 years for a lot of these areas to, to dry up. And the next time we have a, a year where we've got a lot of snow, and we haven't had that here now for the last almost 10 years, um, that we're going to start seeing these same sort of uh, pictures again. The unfortunate part about it is we all get to pay for these kind of damages that are occurring because road infrastructures were totally destroyed in a lot of areas uh, around us. And at the end of the day, it's land use that's, that's done it. Now, I'm not going to just point fingers at people that, uh, like myself, who are in agriculture, but um, a lot of my urban friends, whether they live in Bozeman, Montana, or Bottle, South Dakota, when there's expansion on their cities, it's outside of the city limits a lot of times. The cities are expanding and we're converting grasslands and in some cases croplands 
and urban sprawl with concrete, asphalt, and watered lawns is contributing also to some of the water issues that we're dealing with in our watershed. So one of the co terms that I've coined is no cows, no grass, no birds. Um, I think the key species that we need to be looking at is cows. That's my opinion. If you keep cows on the landscape, you're going to keep the prairies upright. If you keep the prairies upright, you're going to solve a whole host of environmental problems. If you want to talk about clean air, you solve it by having maximum carbon sequestration. Nothing but does it better than diverse grass. If you want to talk about the Sprague's pipit, the prairie orchid, the Topeka shiner, those are all either threatened or endangered species. You want to solve it, you keep the prairie upright. How do you do those things? You keep cows in the landscape. Watch your cow numbers, they'll tell you what's happening within your uh, ecosystem. So what's the takeaway that I want you to hear on this talk is we need to maintain a diverse native grass community. We've got marginal ground on our ranch that we've seeded back to grass. Uh, probably about 95% of the people that live in our area would be farming most of the ground that we've seeded back to grass. And so if you've got some marginal ground, seed it back to grass. If you are going to crop, um, I think what has been proven is no matter if you're in a 12 inch rainfall area or 52 inch rainfall area, you can find a way to no-till. And especially I see people in, in our part of the world that are sub 20 inch rainfall that still will not adopt no-till farming. And that is just, to me, I just don't understand that. Grass filter strips. Um, we, in our, in our area, we really don't have any riparian areas that's not surrounded by grass. And we do use our riparian areas. There's a lot of people that fence their riparian areas out, but we will use them, but it's, all, it's called time and timing. And uh, so, when do we use our riparian areas? When the ground is about as hard as this floor and it's not going to damage them. Um, so we get 100% use out of repairing areas, but we've been able to heal them by using time and timing as our, our method of doing it. More cows. Awareness of land use makes a difference. And then the understanding that when you take cows out of the landscape, off your landscape, and you remove that diversity from your land, you not only remove it from your land, but the feed store goes with it, the veterinarian goes with it, um, anybody that works with livestock knows it's more labor intense, so you lose, you lose some community there. And so remember, the cow is the key species that you need to be thinking about. If you want more information about our ranch, I didn't share a lot about what we're doing in our ranch, but I just wanted to share this story about what happened to Swan Lake. You can check us out on our website. Thank you. Let's give Lyle a hand.